So hi everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Julie Hazelwood Williams, co-founder and executive director of Roots and Rounds IC. Um, she is an activist, researcher, writer, and an educator from Indiana, and for over two decades she has lived and walked with the Chachi Awa and Afro-descendant communities of Ecuador's Pacific Northwestern Chaco rainforests to defend and protect their ancestral territories and cultures. In 2014, she also began collaborating with the Karanki people of San Clemente. She earned a PhD in geography at the University of Kentucky, a master's in Native American studies from UC Davis and in Latin American studies with a concentration in tropical conservation and development from the University of Florida and a bachelor's in community studies from UC Santa Cruz. Her research, writing, and teaching focus on geographies of hope, decoloniality, and diverse cultural ways of knowing collaborative activist geographical methodologies and indigenous human and nature's rights. Since the 1990s, she has taught in various universities in the US, Ecuador, Ireland, and Canada. She currently teaches in environmental studies and the Rachel Carson College at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And Chelsea and I have both had the pleasure of having her for our core teacher, our first quarter here. So yeah, without further ado, Julie, you can take it away. Oh, thanks. And, uh, oh, you are recording right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. I see the little red dot there. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me. And this is a big deal because this is 50 years of Earth Day. And you think back on all the people that fought in 1970 to create this day commemorating taking care of the Earth. And so it's a very exciting day to think that we've made it this far, 50 years. And actually the other day I was thinking about what the 100 year anniversary of the Earth Day would be like. And I realized, well, I'll never know probably, because <laughs> right now I'm 47 and I mean, unless I make it to 97. But what that made me think about was that the earth will be in your all's hands at that point. You, you all probably have gray hair as well, but still the, you all are the inheritors of the earth. And so I'm really excited to be here and to have the chance to talk to you all who are students at UC Santa Cruz and also who will be taking the reins or, you know, the, you know, just taking charge and taking care of the earth. Um, I'm also, as Wave said, co-founder and executive director of Roots and Routes Intercultural Collaborations. And I'm really excited to be teaching at UC Santa Cruz again after having gone to school here. And I also want to just say thanks for coming and, and listening to me today. And in fact, this is the beginning part is going to be participatory. So I wanted to ask you if you would take turns reading these paragraphs. With, with uh, five of you here, maybe Chelsea, we could start at the top and Chelsea could read the title. Definitely. Um, vision with action is stronger than hindsight of 2020. Um, I can wait. read the next part. Yeah. It is said that vision with action is stronger than hindsight of 2020. What are the on the ground implications of this, and especially with the world in emergency? The Earth's immune system is suffering from an extractive approach of life. It is clear as day that climate change and COVID 19 are symptoms of the living world's disease. Ryan. What are we going to do about this unfolding right before our eyes in 2020? How can we take action and stand together to better care for one another and the living world? Allegra. The talk today will focus on what it means to choose to follow your heart's path and see it through. For one UCSC student, 98, and now teaching faculty, this meant becoming a bridge and co-founding an international community-led organization. Ellie, would you please read the last part? Roots and Routes Intercultural Collaborations facil facilitates sharing knowledge between diverse cultures en route to responsibility, 
responsibly stewarding a flourishing living world. Our vision is people standing arm in arm to form an indigenous and youth-led educational exchange network that teaches the world that we are worth more than the resources below our feet. Great, thank you. I wanted to start by taking a pause for a land acknowledgement. Probably, I'm not sure if some of you know that a land acknowledgement is a statement that recognizes the history and presence of indigenous peoples in their enduring relationship to their traditional homelands. In the land acknowledgement for UC Santa Cruz, although some of you are not at UC Santa Cruz, we'll do the land acknowledgement for where we would be. The land on which we gather is the unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking Upi tribe. The Amamutsun tribal band comprised of the descendants of indigenous people taken to the missions of Santa Cruz and San Juan Bautista during the Spanish colonization of the Central Coast is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on these lands and heal from historical trauma. So how many of you on this call knew about the Amamutsun tribal band? Yeah, good. So about I've heard more them, like yeah. half, yeah. So uh, they're doing incredible work, and uh, the tribal chairman's name is Val Lopez, and is a really special sort of person who exemplifies a lot of what I'm going to be talking about on this call, which is uh, speaking and living from the heart and that kind of wisdom. So I thought that it would take one more pause to acknowledge all of you who are here and also to give you a chance to acknowledge everybody else and say what you'd like to offer to the circle. So basically what we'll do is we'll go around and you can say your name, to whom or what you dedicate this Earth Day, and what do you offer to the circle of life? Your name, who or what you dedicate to this Earth Day, and what you offer to the circle of life. So I'll start. You know that my name's Julie Hazelwood, and I dedicate this Earth Day to my mom, to the communities who struggle to protect this, the, to who, ah, to the communities who struggle to protect the lands in Ecuador, California, across the Americas and around the globe, and also to you, the youth of the world. And my offering is an open heart and deep dedication to struggling for a world in which all beings are worthy of respect. I kind of cheated because I, I had time to think about my dedication and offering, but I'm sure that you all can also come up with one speaking from the heart. Um, I can start. Um, so my name is Liz and um, I'm in Cupertino right now. And I dedicate this Earth Day to my family. Um, and an offering, I guess I bring just like, I'm trying to um, spread like education and awareness about Earth Day and what sustainability means in general through kind of our Earth Week events and team and everything. Yeah, um, I can go next. Um, I'm Chelsea. Uh, I'm in Santa Cruz at the moment, and uh, I'm dedicating this Earth Day to the bit of the natural world I was able to see today from my window, even though it got was cooped up inside most of the day. I've heard the birds sing outside, which has been great, and see the sunshine through the window. Um, and what do I bring to this offering? Um, also wanting to bring education and awareness while also um, having a listening ear and trying to learn as well from other people, so. Thanks. Um, I can go. Um, <laughs> I'm Ellie and I'm in San Luis Obispo at the moment. And I dedicate this Earth Day to all the people in our generation that are um, very outspoken about it and working to make a change. And to this offering, I would say I also bring um, 
the ability to listen to everyone's stories and learn from them. Um, I'll go next. Uh, I'm Allegra. I'm in Mountain View right now, and I dedicate this Earth Day to all the natural places that are getting kind of a break right now from human interference, um, but also all of the people and um, people's loved ones who are affected by the virus. Um, and I bring an offering um, understanding and love in my heart for everyone who needs it. Thanks. Hi, I can go next. Um, my name is Jocelyn and I dedicate this Earth Day to all those animals that are on the brink of extinction and to all those activists who are constantly fighting for indigenous rights. And I hope to bring an open mind and dedication to this offering. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I can go next. Um, I'm Ryan. Um, right now I'm in San Diego. And I'd like to dedicate this Earth Day to my parents. Um, and what do I bring to this offering? Um, curiosity to learn and listen. Uh, I'm Sean. Um, I'd like to dedicate this Earth Day to friends and family and uh, my house plants that bring a little bit of the natural world into my room, which helps me get through the day. Um, and what I bring is an open mind and willingness to learn and change my behaviors for the earth. Hi, um, I'm Jothi. Uh, I'm in Cupertino right now. I dedicate this Earth Day to all my friends and family. Um, and to this um, Earth Day, I offer, I guess, um, willingness to listen and try to create change within the communities I'm around um, and maintain sustainab sustainability practices in healthcare. I think, uh, I think we got through everyone. Yeah, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate all the, all your dedications and all that you're offering to being here together. So <laughs> that's a picture of me when I was young. And I wanted to start by sharing a bit of my story, a bit about my roots and the unfolding of the routes that led me to create Roots and Routes Intercultural Collaborations. Um, I guess that in some ways I've always been a rebel because this, but not a rebel without a cause. I would say a rebel with a cause. I'm very happy to know, I'm very happy to say that I think I was born with a sort of determination to make change in the world and also um, walk the path that my heart was telling me to do, that my heart was directing me um, to walk. And this, this picture is funny, not only because it looks funny, but also because uh, the story behind it is that my dad, my mom was said to me before I went to school that day, okay, no matter what you do, you don't wear that jean jacket for the picture. And so I think that that's why I'm smiling so big in that picture is because I was so excited to just be myself in that picture. And another kind of funny story that goes along with, that could go along with this picture is if you see that I'm wearing those glasses, they're like very thick glasses actually. And uh, I always say that I was blind all the time I was learning to see, which is actually a quote from a song, uh, because I, I really couldn't see very well when I was a, a little kid into being an adolescent. And then when I was, I don't know, about 14 or so, I started wearing contacts and they weren't working out for me. So I just stopped wearing the contacts. And now my eyes are 20-20. 
for some reason. So it's just kind of a funny twist of fate. Um, so, but I'm from Indiana, as Wave said in my introduction. I put a map up here because it seems like a lot of you are from California and you might not know that too many states pass that Nevada line over there. So I'm one of those Eastern, Midwest Eastern states right here from Indiana. And um, I grew up in a well-off family, but that was also a household of extreme domestic violence. And so when I was a young child and, and witnessed these circumstances, I was obviously traumatized and I didn't feel that I was experiencing wealth, nor did I really feel a sense of belonging. So I think that really sent me out on the search for diverse understandings of wealth and success and well-being. And that is, I really started off into spending time on, you know, on my own since I was nine years old, going to, to six-week camp and being with people from other countries. I moved to California in 1992 when I went to UC Santa Cruz. You can see that this is a picture with my mom, actually, and it was, I think I was 20, no, yeah, I think I was 20 years old, and you can see that the music building is in back there, that giant music building. But uh, I was a community studies major, which, some of you may know is a social science degree that focuses in social change and they require a six month internship. And so I was trying to figure out what I was going to study. And um, th so this was 1993 and in 1987, there was a report that was published that was called the Brundtland Report that talked about sustainable development. And that was the first time that um, that term was used. So by the time it was 1993, it was a very fresh term. And you know how it is when there's fresh terms and everybody, it's like a buzzword and everybody starts talking about it. And it, you know, in a certain sense, it was revolutionary because, uh, you know, the economic system was out of hand. You, know, you had the Rachel Carson, uh, Rachel Carson book in 1970 that began to uh, call attention to the need to take care of the earth. And then here, 20 years later, they're coming up with a term where you could actually balance economic development with taking care of the earth. So it's kind of a big deal. But at the same time, it seemed to me that like, I was like, well, why does this seem like everybody's talking about it like it's such a new notion? A new word, yes, but like a new idea, I didn't really feel that it was because I was like, well, aren't there like indigenous people who've been living, taking care of the earth since time immemorial? And, you know, um, so I, I decided that I wanted the focus of my social change, you know, entryway to be sustainable development and indigenous cultural revitalization. And so uh, I decided to go to Ecuador. I was lucky to be able to have that opportunity to choose to do my community studies six month internship in a different country. And I chose Ecuador because of a high degree of um, both cultural and biological resilience. So some of you might not know where Ecuador is, so I put this slide up. Obviously, it's the one with the big red arrow. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it's called Ecuador because uh, it's actually called Ecuador, or um, because it's named after the equator. And the equator runs right through here all the way around the world. And um, you can see that also Ecuador is a, has three major regions. It has the Andes Mountains, the Amazon region to the east, and then the Pacific Coastal region to the west. But the Pacific Coastal region 
is uh, down here, it's pretty dry, but up here, it's a really dense rainforest that never gets talked about because the Amazon rainforest um, is the bigger rainforest and more well known. So when I went down there, I worked with the technical unit for the eco development of the Amazon and Awa region, which was a organization of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ecuador. And I, I was really happy that I got to work with the Ecuadorian organization and see how that works. Uh, it was there, they happened to focus on both of the things that um that i was interested in which is indigenous cultural revitalization and sustainable development but they called it the eco development so it's kind of funny when new terms are invented um there people use different variations of that term and then some of them stick some of them don't as you know probably few of you have heard the term eco development because it's not really said anymore so um, that's, that was the organization that I worked with while I was down there for the six months. And for the last two months of my internship, I was, because the first four, so basically what I did during that six months was travel around with uh, different people from the government and meet with communities as well as people of local governments and analyze uh, the obstacles to eco development and try to help them create pathways to be to both um, you know access more markets to have to you know get to ba basically be able to make money but also be able to um, continue to take care of their territories and that was mostly in the amazon but um ironically the last two months of my internship i uh ended up in one of the you know as people say poorest places in the americas and that is where I actually learned about um, completely reverse and diverse notions of wealth. It's like I really learned uh, that wealth could be equated with well-being as opposed to accumulation of dollars. And uh, so you can see the, the Choco rainforest, it doesn't this is the kind of the area we were looking at before but so you can see this is ecuador coast would go all the way down that way and it's just this top corner that's still the rainforest that comes all the way down from panama through colombia into ecuador and um you can also see that it where i worked the san Lo san lorenzo canton is part of the Esmeralda, Esmeraldas province. So the province is like a state within the country of Ecuador and the canton is like a county. And uh, you can see it's right along the border of Colombia. So uh, that has its own sort of implications. So when I first went down to the Choco, uh, there wasn't even a road going down to this area of Ecuador. Like it was such an abandoned and basically seen as kind of like a wasteland that uh, there wasn't even a road down there. And so basically I took a bus to where the roads, the gravel roads stopped, and then a truck picked a four by four truck picked me up, and then we uh, went in like a four wheeler, and then the four wheeler dropped me off three hours down this river where some in uh, the uh, a couple, uh, you know, like a married couple, 
came and picked me up in a little canoe like this. And I went up with them to this, the village of La Ceiba. And one of the most incredible memories that, that I hold is when, you know, first of all, just being in that little canoe in the first place uh, where people are standing up to get, to move down the river, but also that, you know, you could hear in the distance this, you know, really lovely, beautiful, joy joyful, and voices of song. And when we came around a corner, there were Afro-descendant people uh, panning for gold and singing. And that's just like really indicative of the Choco rainforest, which is different from the Amazon, or at least the Amazon, because in Brazil, there are also Afro-descendants. But in the Choco rainforest from Ecuador all the way up to Panama. It's uh, largely populated by um, black and black uh, communities and Afro traditional Afro descendant communities. So it really seemed like a paradise to be there. I mean, you know, I was always really appreciative and blown away by the fact that I was able to be in La Ceiba and with the Chachis and be experiencing this world. It was, um, it, uh, you know, there, we think a lot about um, positionality in Rachel Carson at UC Santa Cruz, and there's no doubt that, you know, uh, that idea, that trope that uh, is, is, rooted in whiteness that there might you know that there might be that ability to go travel around the world and see things that you know other people haven't seen but even so that's something that i want to acknowledge but at the same time um i was always very humbled and grateful to be there and i really went there to learn from the people about how they took care of plants and how they took care of the forests. And uh, this is my, the little sloth that I got to sleep with every night. And these are some of my little friends and the, they also slept with me at night. And uh, it was like a big slumber party. But you can see how beautiful and sparkling and just amazing these rivers and these landscapes are and, and were, especially there's still some, but uh, so the children were my teachers. They uh, taught me how to stand in canoes. Uh, they taught me how to walk in the woods, the, the rainforest. It's really tricky. The, the Choco rainforest is one of the wettest rainforests in the world. And if you don't step in the right places, you'll sink in mud and lose your boots. So I really watched the children and how they would run from root to root. And that's how I, I wrote a poem when I was living with them in 1999 that was called Roots and Routes. And it was about how they would uh, follow the roots. In, in, in making their routes, they would follow the roots along. Uh, and and also the routes of the rivers. And when I wrote that poem in 1999, I had no idea that I would use that, that name of the poem for an organization 20 years later. It just dawned on me 20 years later. I was like, well, what should I call the organization? And I was like, well, of course, go back to those very first moments of learning how to walk in the forest of finding my own path, but with the guidance from indigenous children it just made all all the sense in the world so we worked on communal ethnobotanical gardens because the when i went in with the organization utepa with uh before that time where i took the canoe when we first went in for evaluation um, the Chachi people said that they were having a hard time finding their medicinal plants.
because their forest was being destroyed. And so they wanted to make a ethnobotanical garden. And I had a little bit of agro um, ecology background. And so I worked with them on gathering those plants and planting them and uh, trying to create a space where they might be able to cultivate their plants that they would have found in the forest. But um, one of the routes that I didn't really know about when I first took that river or was walking through the forest is that they were actually creating, remember the gravel road I talked about? From that gravel road, they were creating a road to their community. And you can see this is the road to their community freshly being carved out. In fact, these are uh, trees that are cut up in law and will be lined all the way to their which is like another probably mile and a half or so to their community and then it will be covered with gravel so the chachis um were able to get this road to the community so that they could have better market market access so that they could make some money to pay for their children's uniforms to pay for their children's pencils to give their children better opportunities, to uh, buy oil and salt and rice. And so they traded the logging company the rights to make this, the rights, sorry, they traded the logging company the rights to log in their territory for building this road. And so you can see how development and logging or rainforest destruction was really um, intricately and deeply connected. It, you couldn't have uh, development without destruction at that point. It was the colonization of the lands. And yet they would put up signs like this. You can see the Chachi is standing below the sign waiting for the bus that says, Una sola via, un solo camino, el desarrollo del país. There's just one way, one road, there's just one way, the development of the country. So, you know, development or nothing. And you can even see the children here, they played like they were in a bus or in a car. Like these were the new generation that were learning about, that was their idea of fun. They were still swimming in the rivers a lot. And, that was also their idea of fun, but you can see how it began to be in their way of thinking. But then, so, you know, I just wanted to say to you all as people in your 20s that what you do in your 20s will have a huge impact on who you are in your 40s. Because not only my working in those communities all that time, uh, you know, defined what I'm doing today, but also I, for my um, graduation at UC Santa Cruz, I taught this student uh, directed seminar that was called Self Community in Nature. And it was about looking at the, it was about, uh, sorry, about deconstructing the obstacles between self, community, and nature, and then once, and then reconstructing those relationships. How, what would those relationships look like if they were basically based in well being? You know, the, if we really were taking care of ourselves, if we were really taking care of our communities, and if we thought of nature as, a, a, as an extension of us and wrapped the whole thing in well being. Uh, that's really what my class was about. And in fact, that's really what R Roots and Routes is about. So um, I, I've just been in contact with a friend of mine who sent me pictures of this, of this reader. And she, she took the class. And I was really surprised to see all the readings that were, um, you know, so mixed with uh, people, authors of color and indigenous authors and also other environmentalists that are still really important to the work that Roots and Routes is doing today.
So, but in the, in the Choco, this was 1998, there was only this amount. I don't know if you all know what African oil palms are. They're uh, palms that are mono, mono, um, monocultures that reach across huge expanses of land in Malaysia and um, Indonesia in Colombia and South America, and they're used a lar for a large extent for cooking oils, but also for biodiesel, supposedly environmentally sustainable development biodiesel. And um, oil palm just started being planted in northern Ecuador. There's only that little small amount in 1998, and then it just boomed out and uh, and replaced a huge amount of primary and secondary forests. So um, it was, there was 682 acres in 1998, and then 55,645 acres in 2007. So this was um, replacing a huge amount of forests, but also displacing people and it was surrounding the communities that I was working in, which was still La Ceiba of the Chachis, but also the Afro-descendant community of La Chiquita and Guadualito, which is Awa community, indigenous Awa. So this area was, is very much populated by the indigenous, by, well, like I was saying before, by Afro-descendant communities, but also Awa and Chachi, and there's another um, tribe called Epora people, and also Mestizos. So things went, got pretty bad with the oil palm, and you can see it in this picture, how there are these large extents of oil palm. And at the same time, the communities, there's San Lorenzo, the town, the communities are out there in the forested lands, and they um, are really changing the face of history because they have the very first rights of nature case in the world, which is basically arguing that nature should be treated as a subject of rights. So I'm going to explain that a little more. but. Even though these communities are some of the most marginalized, you know, living on the margins of the margins of society and treated as a sacrifice zone, they are right now, as we speak, um, changing the face of history and what in the scope of who's given legal rights in the world. So, in 2008, Ecuador passed their new constitution, and it was a very revolutionary constitution. They had um, the rights to living well, the rights to uh, plurinationality, which basically means that all indigenous communities have their own self-determination within their territories and should be equally represented in government and across society, and also the rights of nature. Article 71 of the Ecuadorian constitution reads that nature or Pachamama, where life is reproduced and occurs, has the right to integral respect for its existence and for the maintenance and regeneration of its life cycles, structure, functions, and evolutionary processes. In 2000, 10, there was the World People's Conference on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. And they were and still are building the people's world movement for Mother Earth. So 35,000 people came together in April 2010 in Cochabamba, Bolivia. It was the conference was called because of the lack of binding agreements that they were coming to in the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Copenhagen, the COP15. 
And so the president of Bolivia, Evo Morales, called all peoples together across the world to come up with uh, a, a universal declaration that would serve as, an, as a, hopefully in the future, a binding agreement for the United Nations. So I'm going to come back and talk. Sorry, kind of skipped ahead, but uh, I'm going to come back and talk about the rights of nature within the context of Roots and Routes, but I wanted to, for you all to understand a little bit of rights of nature before I plunge into Roots and Routes. So Roots and Routes really is a receptacle for hope and action. And the most exciting part is that exactly where we're headed is still unfolding be before our eyes. We're, we're all clear that we're working for and defending the well-being of humankind in the living world around us. And yet, um, we're, we're definitely taking baby steps because we were just, we were developed, we were not developed. We were born as an organization in February 20th, 2018. So bring, putting together a international community-based organization is a huge amount of work and heavy lifting. And it is, it's a really fast process in some ways because it's kind of like the organism takes its own life. It's kind of like almost like having a baby when all of a sudden they start walking or crawling really fast and then next thing you know it's walking. So it definitely has its own life. And at the same time, you know, it seems it's slow, you know, it's eventual. So um, I'm going to take you to the website. Oops. Can you see the web, the um, window? Um, not yet. It still shows the presentation. Oh, it does. Hmm. Okay, let's see. It says stop share. Now I'm going to share screen again. I'm glad I asked. <laughs> okay, so can you see it now? Yes. Okay, so this is the Roots and Routes website. Uh, you can see that the way that we set it up is that you can go and right away. Uh, see what uh, you know all the different elements of the website in English and Spanish. Our mission is to facilitate sharing knowledge between diverse cultures en route to responsibly stewarding a flourishing living world. Our vision is people standing arm in arm to form an indigenous-led educational exchange network that teaches the world that we are worth more than the resources below our feet. So if we go to about, what we do uh, is we build bridges between communities and open spaces for indigenous and ancestral peoples to lead the way in stewarding life-sustaining human societies. You can take a look at this later and see it more in depth, but we are an educational, scientific, research, and charitable organization, and we're dedicated to collaborating with on-the-ground communities, community-engaged projects, and cultural-based approaches to sustainability to collectively facilitate a world based in respect, cross-cultural trust, and re reciprocity. So you can see here what that this is very much building upon what I was thinking about when I was in my 20s in, in community studies with the sustainable development in, in indigenous cultural revitalization. And then one of the board members made up this term, which I love, because, well, you know, when we think about what is the common element of indigenous cultures uh, across the world, one of those elements is that the 
the thinking with the heart, the living from the heart, the you know ancestral wisdom that's based in really living from the heart. And so I made up with this term sustainability from the heart, from the heart, but my friend and board member made up the term in Spanish, which is really tricky, Cora Sostenibilidad, because corazón is heart, and sustainability is sustainability. So uh, one thing that makes Roots and Routes really special is that we walk our talk by, usually the way the organization is set up is that you have well-known people who might have good connections as part of the board you know they might be from the united states or usually places in the north and then you have a staff uh that um it usually is just people who are hired from it might be that country or it might be just from the united states or wherever the organization is based and then they go and work in communities in other countries. But instead, we're trying to put the whole process upside down and let the decision makers be at the table. Oh, sorry, the community members be at the decision making table. And so we have uh, indigenous and other leaders from their communities from the particular places where we're working. So we have Renee, who's native Hawaiian, and Willie, who's Mayan, and Tammy, who um, is a leader and advisor to indigenous nations in Peru, and uh, P Paul, who is good at running business, and we have Akalino Eraso Caicedo, who's from San Lorenzo, uh, Andean Ecuadorian representative, as well as Amamutsin uh, Alexis, who's from here from California. So we're trying to create a new structure within the organization where the communities are leading the direction of where our organization is going, as opposed to just showing up and saying, here's the projects. Uh, do you take them or leave them? And we work in, as you can see, in Ecuador in these places, in Guatemala, Hawaii, um, California, and Peru. These are all places that we're still having our projects develop. In, in Guatemala, we're working closely with Willie to work on uh, indigenous and also just a um, Pub, like a alternative space public run university. It's kind of like a no university. It's a university of life. And so um, I want to leave time for questions. So I'm trying to get through here. But you can come back and look at our story and where we work. I've kind of given you a lot of our story today. Our programs are based in community-led education. So you, this is, these are pictures from uh, University of California, Davis, um, summer abroad. Right now we're working on a University of California, Santa Cruz summer abroad to see if it's approved. We're waiting, in fact. The COVID has put off the decision. But, um, and then we also have a program that's based in intercultural exchanges. So here's a video, I can't show it to you now, but it's when the youth of the Choco rainforest came up to the Andes and they were able to see what the community led tourism project that they have in the Andes as an alternative to mining. And they were able to just exchange between their cultures in general and just be proud and strengthen their own cultural traditions. We also have collaborative projects, which is, uh, in this case, Amazonian filmmakers who are, came to the Choco rainforest 
to work with the youth to create a film to document the way that the communities are standing up to the oil palm companies. And so that's a really exciting project uh, that we've been working on for the last three years. And then the cultural based sustainability, these projects are still to be developed, but it's basically just saying that, you know, the people living in the Choco and, and in Hawaii and Guatemala and elsewhere are really the experts within their own living territories. And they uh, not only are maintaining, uh, even in the face of all this destruction, their cultural-based sustainability, but they also can teach us about it. So, and then the last thing is campaigns, which is um, the, we have a documentary, the documentary that we we're talking about, the Right to Nature lawsuit in the Intercultural Center. So, Wave, I have a question for you. I see that it's 5.57. How much, are we going to end right at 6? Uh, um, even though we started late, or? No, we can um, definitely time for questions, and if there's anything else you want to throw in as well. I, um, I think the Zoom thing is set until, like, 6.30, but, like, however long for questions and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, checking in with other people on the call. Well, other people can leave if you need to leave, but also if you want to stay, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but I guess what I'm really asking is, I was hoping to show this short documentary of five, it's not a documentary, it's a trailer of a documentary. Oh yeah. And So these are some of the campaigns that we're, we have right now, and we're going to come back to the Right to Nature lawsuit. Really, the documentary is created to uh, show the world about the Right to Nature lawsuit and about the, you know, the everyday struggles of the people against the oil palm and oil palm companies. And not only the oil palm companies, but a whole bunch of other uh, extractive processes that they're up against. And I welcome you all to come back and look more in depth about these campaigns. But for right now, we're just going to focus on this documentary. So you can read down here below that this documentary interweaves the stories of two communities, the Awa community of Guadalito and the Afro-descendant community of La, Chiquito, of La Chiquita, who since time immemorial live in the last remaining stands of the tropical Choco jungle along the Ecuadorian Colombian border and Pacific, Pacific Ocean. The documentary's vision emerges from an, Amazon, from an Amazon Choco video school experience that takes place in communities considered disposable but who resist and fight for their survival. They lack drinking water because their shared natural watershed, the Santiago Cayapas River, is contaminated by large oil palm plantations directly linked to, to drug trafficking and illegal armed groups. The dispossession of their lands and subsequent slave-like work conditions in the very lands that were their ancestors. Nevertheless, the people of San Lorenzo show the world a story of resistance and hope. For nearly two decades, they maintained the first lawsuit for the rights of nature in the world and, and sustain a sense of community seeking justice and respect for their territories, for their culture, as well as for their ancestral, individual, and collective rights. Sumat Kausai and the rights of Pachamama. So here is the documentary. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it and everything. Yo he sido desde muy tierna edad, he sido de trabajar al campo. Y hasta ahora que esta edad tengo. 
En el tiempo de mi infancia había, había muchas cosas del campo. Muchos animales silvestres, tanto avícolas como terrestres, y, y también peces del río. En el agua había mucho que, que comer. Pero a través del tiempo, Resulta que apareció una dicha conegación por Colombia y esa conegación ha terminado con todos los animales del campo. Todo se escaseó, cosa que no hubo nada, caña, yucas, de todo se, se quedaron eso como colorados las todos se cayeron pestes, de todo, todo, todo. Totalmente ya casi no había nada. Hemos sentido un, un malestar bien fuerte para nosotros. Nosotros como aguas aquí, vamos, estamos sufriendo. Ahí muriendo en noviembre, en Cimecas. Nosotros salimos desplazados. Este es mucho más fácil. Lentes de todo tipo. Dura, que no tenemos agua, man. No tenemos quien los ayude para sobrevivir. Ya tengo, por ejemplo, 30 años, 40 años está viviendo aquí en la comunidad desde que yo te la tengo. El agua no lo sirve para nada. Porque el agua sigue contaminada. Si quiera que tuviéramos las aguas en los ríos buenas, sanas, como eran más antes que había, de todo. Pero ahora uno vive el poquito contaminado que todo les toma huele el huele. No hay escuelas en los campos. ¿Qué vida vamos a hacer los pobres? Si quisiera que me decían vamos del presidente y lo primero que le decía al presidente, nosotros queremos nuestra agua y por culpa de ustedes, por darle permiso a la palmera, es que la gente se está muriendo. Yo quisiera que ustedes fueran a beber esa agua. Eso no es justo de lo que están haciendo el gobierno. no han traído problemas porque han destruido muchas hectáreas de bosque. Se han extinguido muchas especies de animales que ya no lo hay. Pero hay que luchar, luchar mucho porque hay muchos problemas aquí. Que nosotros como pueblos ancestrales de esta zona que es nuestro territorio, que lo amamos, que lo queremos mucho y que luchamos por defenderlo, por defender la naturaleza, porque es importante defender la naturaleza. Por estamos jodidos.
Stop share, right? Yes. Okay, and now I'm going to share screen again. So these are some of the things. So as you can see, that film that that you the trailer that you just watched. That was that it's not only the film itself that's important, it's also the processes. Because for example, the drone footage that you saw of all those oil palm plantations was a huge intercultural um, coming together of people from the Andes and myself and all sorts, all sorts of different actors from San Lorenzo who came together and made this community-based droning happen. You know, and so it's not only about the end product of the documentary itself, but it's also, as I said, the collaborative processes that Roots and Routes is helping to put together. That's really what we do is like bring different people together to make things happen. So um, one of those things is helping to sustain the rights of nature case. And these are some of the things that you can do. I think that afterwards WAVE is going to be posting or doing something with this presentation. Yes. And so if you don't get it right now, you can come back. But you can like the Roots and Routes Facebook page. It's rnr.org is the way you find it on with the Facebook um, search, as well as the the film Facebook page, which is Hope and Struggle in the Ecuadorian Choco. You can also, right now we have 12 uh, interns that were at one point or another my students from UC Santa Cruz and other institutions. And we have this really great team this quarter and um, doing all sorts of really awesome projects to move routes and routes forward. You can also share this poster that I'll share with Wave, and she can uh, put it on the different social media. And most importantly, you can follow your bliss. The one of our count, one of our uh, council of advisors members, Alarian Merkulov, he's an Unandagan elder. And just because of lack of time, I'm not going to read this, but he basically says that climate change and it you know the temperature rising sh is a symptom of the sick of the sickness of the earth as well as obviously the coronavirus itself and so what can we do he says the world is asking indigenous people what to do the only answer is to drop in your heart and ask your heart what you ought to be doing or not doing every one of us has instructions in our heart. So having said that, be like a tree in pursuit of your cause, stand firm, grip hard, thrust upward, and bend with the winds to the tranquility of the heavens. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask. Um, and also if you don't feel comfortable talking, you can also put them in the chat and I can read them out as well. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And y'all definitely, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, I was wondering how, like, when you talk about when you first went to Ecuador, like, how uh, did you first get involved with these communities and what was your, your journey um, in how? how like how you're able to like learn from them yeah and um okay so how i first got involved with them was that um you know when i let's see that's a good question when as a community studies major and we had to do those six month internships I, it was it, at this point, this is, this is uh, going to show how old I am, but the, 
internet was really just beginning to take off. So I did a search. I don't even think Google existed at that time. I did a search though. And I found a, um, I found somebody who was doing ethnobotanical work. And so I called his organization, which actually happened to be his mother. And his mother put me in touch with his, his sister who needed a roommate in Quito, Ecuador. And then she put me in touch with the brother who uh, basically helped me to get in touch with that organization, UTEPA, because they were beginning to do that work with, um, so, you know, the UTEPA, which is the unit for the eco-development of the Amazon and Awa region, they uh, were, as I said, part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and they they were part of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs because they worked with indigenous people whose communities were divided by different borders. And so that's how um, I start, you know, through those different connections, I got tied in with the the UTEPA and then UTEPA introduced me to those uh the different communities on the ground and you know I would say in general that if you're interested in working with you know grassroots community or you know communities on the ground probably the best way to go about getting in touch with people is through some sort of organization that works with them. You know, Roots and Routes, for example, that's one of the things that we're going to focus on is helping students to get in, in direct contact with communities and work directly with indigenous communities in Ecuador, Guatemala, Peru, and uh, hopefully Hawaii and California. Definitely California and hopefully Hawaii as well. We're just kind of, some of those are in development, but um depending on the interest of a student or a, a youth a person of a youth person um, then we can put you in touch cool thank you so much and also other nonprofits can as well just so you know any other questions I know we're running over time, so I appreciate you all staying the extra time. We did get a late start and everything, but still. Are there any questions in chat or any other questions? I have one more question, actually. Um, so how do you suggest taking the things um, that you've learned throughout all these years, um, and how can we bring that to our local communities? the things that I'm talking about, how can you take them to your local communities? Yeah, how can we um, spread awareness or help um, in our own local communities? Yeah, it depends on if you mean spread awareness about what's happening, for example, in Ecuador or take what's happening in Ecuador and uh, apply that to the communities or both. Oh, okay. Well, um, let's see. So definitely in terms of spreading what's, you know, spreading the word on what's happening in Ecuador, you can get in touch with Roots and Routes, you can get in touch with me, you can get in touch with other board members. Probably really at this point, I'm the point person, but, uh, and I'd be happy to give a talk or um or just talk i don't know you know either give a talk or be put in touch with certain people in your in your local communities the other is that rights of nature for example right now that's something that's a that's 
uh, approved in the Ecuadorian constitution, but it's happening through, there's, it's a whole world movement. You know, the nature is being recognized as a subject of rights in New Zealand, in India, in Pennsylvania, in Oregon, even in California uh, with the, uh, with the, um, I forget the, I forget the name of the indigenous people in California. It's pretty new, but uh, so I think spreading the word about the importance of the rights of nature is also that you, something you can share with your communities. And then also the processes of um, learning from indigenous people and other ancestral communities you know, as the message from Olarian Merkulov says, you know, one of the main things that's happening in Santa Cruz and really across the United States as well, you know, whether it's the Keystone Pipeline or uh, the keeping mining out of uh, your stock for the Amamutsin is just really getting in touch with your local communities, finding out what the most pressing issues are and forming uh, relationships with what they're doing and um, just trying to get involved with what matters most to them. Because I would say that overall, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years is just working you know, working very closely with the communities, learning from them, spending time with them, laughing with them, forming relationships, and then asking them, what matters most to you? What do we really need to address here? So it's a whole, you know, it's a whole process of really just creating relationships and listening to people and then putting their needs and forming campaigns around their needs. And not only campaigns, but actions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, it doesn't look like we have anything else in the chat, but again, if anyone wants to ask questions, feel free. Well, we we can call it a wrap because we're all we're already over time, so. Yeah, Unless thank anybody you. else has any questions, yeah. No. And I can also always, if you um, want to email like the Earth Week email or anything like that, I can always like put you in contact with uh, Julie. And I'll definitely send out the poster once you send that to me. So I'll have more information. Okay, um, great. Well, thanks yeah. so much for letting me speak on Earth Day. That means a lot to be able to speak with students of the school that I was a student once and share with you all about know that it hasn't been an easy journey by the way it's you know it's a lot of uh a lot of hardship and you know it, it's a lot of struggle to work with communities that are um struggling so much themselves so it takes a lot of dedication so i really hope for you all that you all fall in love with what you're doing and find the strength to and resilience to carry you through the hardships of what it means to be dedicated to communities and to making this earth a better place. Great. Well, thank you so much for giving this presentation and thanks to all of you for listening. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>